I am a Snizhnayan diplomat. You know what happens if you lay a finger on me. I swear, if you strike me, I will make sure... The Fatui will make sure that your precious Inazuma... Stop! I order you! And you! Filthy rats! All of you! <laughs> La Senora's death came as a shock. Not only did we witness one of the first on-screen deaths, but the dreams of summoning such a beautiful villainess also went up in smoke as soon as the Raiden Shogun unleashed the Muso no Hitotachi. Of course, that hasn't stopped people from debating whether or not she's truly dead, or if being alive is necessary for a character to be able to be summoned. But I think that's the wrong conversation to be having. Rather than question whether or not she's dead, we should be asking whether or not Mihoyo ever intended for her to be playable in the first place. And I uh, hate to break it to you, but I believe that La Senora was never meant to be playable. I am not saying this for shock value or to crush the hopes of anyone who wanted to summon for her at some point. I just think that Senora's death has created a great opportunity to go over some telltale signs of a non-playable character, and maybe that can hopefully help people keep their expectations realistic as new characters are introduced in the future, by giving you, you know, some things to look for. That aside, I would like to say before we begin, that none of the following observations I'll be making are evidence to suggest that she's never going to be playable, okay? Only that in her currently existing design, she was never intended to be. She would need a completely different or at least a heavily altered design to become a playable candidate, which is kind of unfortunate because I know tons of people absolutely adore her current design, you know, as it is. But the bottom line is, it's her overall model that shoehorns her into the role of an NPC. Period. Here's the deal. Mihoyo has some pretty specific rules when it comes to designing characters, especially when it comes to designing playable characters. Playable characters generally have something long and flowy somewhere on their outfit, or at least have long hair, for example. Mihoyo says that this adds an element of dynamic movement that they really like. Of course, this isn't a perfect rule, as we do get characters like Klee and Bennett, who only have small straps on their backpacks and, you know, fanny pack bag things that Bennett has, um, that kind of flow behind them. Sort of. But in those cases, they also have those large bags that bounce along with them to, you know, simulate movement in a slightly different way. The point is that the character has to be designed around their movements and their feel. Klee is tiny, but she's bouncy and kinda heavy. She's, she's got a very Kirby-like feel, so her backpack's movement helps emphasize both her size and her playful bounce. To compare, Yanfei is tall, and she's also bouncy during her attack animations, but her range of movement is much greater than Klee, so she goes up and down and she bends over and all sorts of stuff, so a bag would make her feel way too heavy when she needs to feel much lighter. Klee, by comparison, since she's short, needs the bag to make her feel more compact. But then you have someone like Ningguang, who's mostly a stationary fighter, but she occasionally twirls. Her long sleeves and parted hair help to emphasize her delicate movements here. But there's one thing that every playable character has in common, and that is an appealing view from behind. This is because, while well, we need to look at the characters from the front during cutscenes and the like, most of the actual gameplay will have us staring at the backs of our favorite characters. Mihoyo goes out of their way to ensure that every playable character has a view from behind that is not only appealing, but very distinctive. Like a very distinctive silhouette. You'll notice, for example, that characters with long hair usually have it parted in two so you can see their costume and their overall figure. Capes are always short, and often only cover only one half of the body as illustrated by units like Kaya and Eula. Even someone like Venti, who has the most cape coverage of any character in the game, has his cape split down the middle and made of a really lightweight, bouncy, and flowy material that flies all the way up when he moves so you can still see the rest of the back of his outfit. 
La Senora, on the other hand, was designed to be viewed primarily from the front and with no extreme movements in mind. This is because you as the player are meant to interact with her from the front. She is a front-facing villain. Like, if you look at her from the back, you can't see her figure at all. She is completely obscured by her cape, and while that cape is split down the middle like Venti's, it's floor length and meant only for dramatic flair. Because the split gets covered by another layer halfway up, any dynamic movement from things like running would be completely obscured. Case in point is this scene where she takes the gnosis from Venti. You have to get a really low angle in order to see any of her limbs, and that goes against all other design principles for any other playable characters. Notice how other units with dresses or coattails rarely have them go past the knee. The character with the longest skirt is actually Rosaria with a mid-shin length, and although her skirt is also split in three separate places, it's also cut inwards so that you can still see the shape of her hips. Senora's skirt in comparison is floor length and completely concealing even though it's split on the sides. But the same can be said of her front. The front skirt flap is kind of a clipping nightmare being all the way down to the ground. You can just tell she's not designed for anything other than really subtle movements. She's designed to be imposing and regal. Her entire outfit is built around having a foreboding back that turns around into a revealing femme fatale frontal. Like when you get to the king's chamber in a game and he has his back to you to start and so all you see is that big red fur trimmed cape and then he turns around and stares you down and you'll never see his back again because he'll only face you from the front while he's sitting on his throne. It's like an intimidation thing, right? It's like that, that moment of turning around that they're going for, that dramatic flair. Anyway. That's the impression that La Senora's design gives. Her closest comparison is honestly Ning Guang, and Ning's design methodology is very, very different, even though they're both pretty stationary, elegant sort of ladies, you know? Ning Wong has a very short skirt in comparison. She's got nothing along her back. Her hair isn't in one long piece. It's split into two, so you can still see the back of her outfit. And then compare Senora to Child. Child's figure is viewable at all angles, and he's got a scarf that flows behind him for dynamic movement. That's the hallmark of a playable character. Heck, even Scaramouche looks like he was designed to be playable because of his long flowy bits in the back, his hat veil. Those are transparent, so you can still see him even though it covers his backside. And the veil cuts off mid-shin like Rosaria's. He was designed to be viewed from multiple angles, whereas Senora was not. She was primarily designed to be viewed from the front. Will he be playable? Maybe, maybe not. But the point I'm trying to make is that the design methodology that goes into designing a good villain is different from what goes into designing a good playable character, especially when you're moving in a 3D space. Now, with all that said, this does not mean that La Senora will never be playable. It just means that the design of hers that she has right now, the only one we've seen, was never put together with playability in mind. She could still come back and be playable, but she would end up with a different outfit, or at least a heavily modified one. I'm sure that all of her fans actually want to be able to see her curves from behind, right? And this is what I meant when I said I think we'll see her again, but not in the way we remember her in a different video, or in probably like a dozen streams at this point. I genuinely do think we will meet her again, but I do think she'll be a very different person, or at least she'll look a bit different. Maybe she'll be like the Rosaline of the past. Who knows? Anyway, I hope you guys found this video helpful and a big shout out to this person right on the screen who left a comment on my Scaramouche analysis video because they were the ones who first pointed out the issue of La Senora's skirt being a clipping nightmare, which is what made me want to look into this idea in the first place. So thanks so much for the insight. Take care guys, and I'll see you in the next video.